Hi, everybody. Welcome to Bio1B. Perhaps welcome to Cal Berkeley. For some of you, this might be your first lecture at Cal. <coughs> and for others, um, perhaps your first course in, in integrative biology. So I'm the first of three lecturers, as you probably are aware. During the regular semester, during the regular year, we have um, this course divided into three modules. And this year, ecology is going first, followed by the evolution module with Dr. John Hulzenbeck, and then the botany module with Dr. Bruce Baldwin. These modules can really go in any order. Um, this is the first time that I, ecology has gone first in, uh, in some years, if it's, if it's ever gone first. And um, so we don't have much to build on here for the ecology section in terms of our basic biological knowledge, except what, what you bring in from your previous education. So I will occasionally, I, uh, I can't introduce absolutely every term and every concept as we go. I need to assume some things about your knowledge, and um, you'll need to draw on your entire store of knowledge. I'll be mentioning far-flung countries or the occasional organism like an urchin, and I might just assume that either you've heard of that country or that organism, or that you will tap it into Google and you will check on it. Um, but I will try to speak slowly and clearly as as, as possible. Um, this course is difficult, uh, certainly. We don't apologize for that if it's hard, but we should apologize if it's um, confusing, unclear, or disorganized. Um, here we are, right? At, so they say the greatest public university in the world, so we're not going to apologize if it's hard, but it's our, it's our responsibility um, to, make it, to make it clear for you. Okay, I'll primarily use the board just for um, writing terms, um, outlining points, but really I'm focused on, on my slides um, in the presentation. And I will give you a subset of these slides as a PDF file that will go on to BSpace after the lectures. Um, one of the goals in Bio1B is to help develop you as good note takers. And that means, um, that means coming to class and taking notes uh, with an old fashioned pen or pencil. So really try to do that. It's early, <laughs> early in the day. And um, it'll be a struggle sometimes to keep awake. But there are going to be elements of the lectures that are not on the webcast, particularly videos I show and any comments I make during certain videos and it's just a fact of Bio1B that the students that come to lecture perform better. They get higher grades. So try your best. Uh, of course, you're not going to make every one. Let me just um, comment on a couple of other course logistical matters. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, we have too many more interesting things to do. Um, but I should point out that your book the eighth edition of Campbell um, is the one of this shade of maroon and black. Um, and it's available at the local stores. I think Ned's is the only one stocking the book right now with um, such that you can use this coupon, this 10% off coupon. You can also find it um, at various other places, including online. The eighth edition is what we're using. And it behooves you to use the eighth. I've given only the reading assignments for the eighth on the course website. But on the PDF I just put up this morning on BSpace, I do provide a conversion to the seventh edition, which some of you might carry from other courses. But they're not the same book. And, um, and you know, I think you could get away with it, but you do yourself a small disservice by using the old edition. Um, if, it's, if it's okay with you, it's okay with me. I'll provide the um, conversions on that 
on that file on vSpace. It's up there already. Make sure you get into the swing of vSpace if you've never used it before by Monday. No, um, no labs next week, as Mike mentioned. You do have your discussion sections, and then a week off of discussion and labs, and the following week, discussions and labs start full force. So we're, we're easing into the semester nicely. We, we, we don't need to hit the ground running too fast here. Um, today, um, today I'm focused on, by way of introducing what ecology is, I'm, I'm really focused on the history of ecology. I, I tend to like to introduce topics uh, from a historical perspective when possible, and I'm um, really doing that today and reaching, reaching back to look at the roots of ecology <coughs> in order to give you an idea of what ecology is and what ecologists do. I didn't have much knowledge or awareness of ecology when I got to college. Um, Partly that's because ecology has really taken off since I was in college. Um, ecology has been following a, an exponential growth curve, um, and there's a lot more awareness of ecology because of environmental problems that we face, but there's, a, there's just an expansion within the science itself that is real, that has occurred over the last uh, many years. My high school biology classes might not have been up to snuff that might have been part of it too. I don't. I'm not sure. Um, but some of you, for some of you, ecology will be um, will be a new a new field of study. Um, and what I wanted to do, do today is to try to give you a sense of what it is. So we'll be looking into its roots in in basic natural history observation, and we'll be looking at some examples of natural history and how it fed the ecological tradition and how natural history observation continues to feed ecology today. We'll be looking at some exemplars of that tradition, that natural hist history tradition, and then we'll start to approach definitions of ecology um, as we get into the 20th century um, and try to, we'll try to show that ecology is an integrative discipline. It integrates field work with laboratory work with theoretical and modeling work. And um, finally, we'll, we'll draw a distinction between ecology and environmentalism um, with a couple of examples. Natural history, it's kind of a uh, old-fashioned in some contexts these days, the idea of natural history. But at Berkeley, um, it's still taken very seriously. Natural history, you can define it if you want, as the study of nature and natural phenomena, usually based on observation and description. We still have courses in natural history here in this department. Natural history is often dependent on very simple and patient observations of natural phenomena, sitting in the field and watching an organism perform a certain behavior, describing a plant in its growth in the laboratory, its morphology and its morphological changes through time, Natural history is not limited to the study of biological phenomena, to the study of living phenomena. If one were interested in the tides and their influence on the geology of the bay, that would be a study in natural history. It encompasses the full range of natural phenomena, whether physical, chemical, or biological. But generally, when we're using the term in biology, we're, we're, we're speaking about a, a descriptive and observation-based study of organisms and their relationship to the environment. We are fortunate to be living in 
uh, the most diverse state in the country in terms of its biology. And here in Northern California, around the Bay, we are very fortunate with uh, an amazing local ecosystem in terms of its diversity and a rich history and a lot of resources for its study locally. Um, and if one were studying zooplankton or sharks or blue herons on the bay by observation and documentation of those observations, whether photographic, whether written, or um, even without formal documentation at all, one is conducting a natural history. But the best natural history does involve clear documentation and a careful recording of observation. In trying to elucidate um, the idea a little better, we're going to go way back to, um, to some 30,000, 32,000 years ago. K-A here, I'll just note it now because I'll be coming back to it eventually. I'll have to erase this now. We'll be working very consistently at the interface of present time and past time, at the interface of paleo and neo, of the old and the new. And um, this is just one of those cases where I should elucidate, um, because you may not have the information at your disposal already, what I mean by this, this idea, K-A, all I'm, all I'm meaning is thousands of years, okay? K standing for kilo and A for annum, thousands of years. You might see me use capital M-A, mega annum, millions of years, okay? I have particular interests in paleontology and um, we'll, be, we'll be using the historical record um, consistently throughout the course. There you go, for those in TV land watching at home. KA, thousands of years. MA, millions of years. Oh, okay, so um, Chauvet Cave in southern France was discovered only in the mid-90s, 1994, by spelunkers, by cave uh, enthusiasts, not scientists, um, who went into the deep recesses of one of these cave systems and discovered fabulous galleries of rock art um, on the walls of these caves. Now, many sites like this were known in, in Europe, and many sites around the world document the artistic activities of humans um, over tens of thousands of years. In Australia and Africa, here in these caves of Western Europe, you have exquisite preservation of, um, of the paintings on these walls as a result of the unique environments of those cave systems. So here at Chauvet, when the cave explorers brought attention to this discovery and scientists went in, they observed some paintings such as this, panels on the walls. You can get a sense of the scale from that guy's head of uh, these, these horses, um, something related to horses, something in the family equidae. You recognize them um, as something horse-like, maybe zebra-like, something like that. Remember, this is Western Europe, 30 to 32,000 years ago, something in there. You not only have these panels of illustration, you have on the floor of, this, of these caves bones. You have fossil bones, so you can start to interpret your, your paintings with reference to the bones and teeth and, in some cases, feces, the scat, the poo of these organisms. All of these things you use to reconstruct our, your knowledge of what these things are and what the people who painted these things were doing, possibly thinking. A big panel like this, you can see 
something like a rhinoceros here, right? Pretty clear rhino form, maybe indicating the movement, the, the movement of the horns there. Elephant-like forms here. What are these back here behind the, uh, maybe baby elephant there? What's that? It's a bear, right? You recognize it as a bear. It's got the little ears. It's got the short muzzle. It's got the little face. It's a bear, darn it. You, <laughs> you recognize it because it's so well depicted. It captures the features of that organism so well that it's just with these few strokes, not only what kind of animal it is, generally speaking, but something about what it's doing. This is an individual, who, the person who painted this, um, that has made clear natural history observations during their lifetime. There's no bear posing for this picture, right? They're going on their memory and their experiences of, of bears. And these are, these are not bears that are alive today. These are, these are a different species of bear. These are cave bears, very common during this period um, in Western Europe. More vegetarian maybe than some of the big bears today, um, but you know, a bear nonetheless, a member of the bear family. And what are those that were creeping up behind the baby elephant? Lions. Lions in France? Well, yeah. Maybe a, maybe a subspecies of the living lion. Taxonomy, as always, is con controversial, the taxonomy, the naming of these creatures, um, at what level we rank them. But they're clearly lions. And taking everything into context, it's, it looks like they're in a hunt. And you can even learn something about the behavior of these extinct populations of lions from these paintings, because they're so carefully documented. They, don't, they tend not to have big shaggy manes, for example. They don't have a big you know, male king of the beasts lion mane. Maybe they didn't back then, this group of lions. Maybe they didn't have manes. In some cases, it looks like the males are in the lead because the ones in the front have testicles. Um, perhaps, unlike the lions today, maybe, maybe the males took uh, more of a lead in these pack hunting strategies where it tends to be a female-led <coughs> strategy today. You can actually learn something about the biology of these creatures as a result of the careful documentation and depiction of these organisms by these artists. Another point where I should just stop, and um, it would be great to be building on the evolution section in discussing some of this, um, but I should stop and, and note uh, the structure of these names, right? This is just a, a common name. That's our English name, not standardized. We call these things cave lions, but in French they'll call them something else, and in Japanese they'll call them something else. We standardize, we standardize our name for these organisms by using the Latin name, which we italicize, right? It's a good place to introduce this here because I'm going to talk about Linnaeus in a second. Linnaeus, right? Sorry, I'm going to have to go to the board. Yeah, so... Um, this is maybe a, a name you recall from a previous course, Linnaeus, Carolus Linnaeus. He was actually born, uh, I believe he was born Linné, but he, he Latinized everything, including his own name. So we know him as Linnaeus, um, famous for advancing a system of nomenclature, the binomial system of nomenclature. to bring organization to our naming of biological organisms. And what he did was suggest that we use a binomen, a two-part name, such as Ursus Spileus, so that each kind of organism, each species of organism, would have a two-part name like this, comprised of a genus 
and a species. The genus that we capitalize that goes first, followed by the specific epithet that goes second that's not capitalized. And if you're writing it on the board or on paper, you should underline it. If you're typing it, you should italicize it. And so if you ever see a, a name such as this with a capital on the first word and a lowercase on the second word in italics, you're probably dealing with a Latin name, a formal scientific name, a binomen that represents a particular species, a particular kind of organism. And you need to know this. If nothing else, by the end of Bio 1B, um, just know that. Know that that's how you write a Latin name because you see it in the newspaper all the time that uh, they'll capitalize both words and it just looks awkward and looks amateurish and after getting through Bio 1B, it's just um, you won't make that mistake. Okay, so um, by way of uh, introducing Linnaeus a little bit there, let's look at Linnaeus' role in, in the history of ecology. Um, I, I bring up a couple of people here in part because I don't think they get the credit they deserve in, um, in the history of ecology. Linnaeus, um, Linnaeus's ideas were very interesting actually. Um, but it should be noted that these were what the writings we attribute to Linnaeus were not just Linnaeus's. The historians have, have shown that many of his writings, although produced under his mentorship, were produced by what are something like graduate students. And then their names kind of fell off the works over time, and we attribute them all to Linnaeus, right? It's uh, something that's been happening for a long time, um, less and less. Um, as, science, as science continues, but a, a very common thing in the past. So um, we don't know who wrote the economy of nature specifically. It was um, probably Linnaeus and one of his students in some combination, but Linnaeus is the mentor in this process. And this essay, <coughs> this brief essay on the economy of nature was translated into English and was was read. Um, it can be hard, very hard to find a copy of this essay and the other essays of relevance that Linnaeus wrote today, but um, we have one of the best libraries in the world here in this, in this very building, and you can find um, some translations from the 1800s of these essays, and uh, you, should, you should go take a look for fun. Maybe not during the semester, you're too busy, but um, after studying some ecology, you'll see just how how foundational some of these ideas were of Linnaeus's. He, he spoke of an economy of nature, a system of organismal relationships, of checks and balances in nature that give rise to the patterns we see today. And his phrase was taken up, as we'll see in England, by, by Darwin and others, this economy of nature, this idea and this phrase of economy of nature. As an exemplar of the natural history tradition, we can, we can focus on a couple of individuals, including Gilbert White, who, who was very, very widely read. His, his one book in particular, The Natural History of Selborne, which went through many editions and has just been read by countless individuals since it was written in the 1700s, where he he wrote about, his, about the natural phenomena of his local area, including, for example, the birds that lived in his local area, where scientists were busy studying specimens in museums that were brought into museums and describing differences. Gilbert White was out on the lawn watching birds and describing their activities. And he knew he could distinguish certain species of birds based on their calls, based on the times of migration, that scientists based on museum spe specimens could not distinguish because they didn't have that living information about these creatures. He documented all these things very carefully, wrote them down, and made contributions to science as a result of his patient field observations. Or here in America, someone also who doesn't get um, 
much credit for his work at, his, at the end of his life, Henry David Thoreau. You, you may know Thoreau from um, uh, just as a man of letters, having written Walden, or from um, political science with civil disobedience or something like this. But Thoreau was also a, a very accomplished naturalist, working um, in New England. He, he was at Harvard, um, wasn't really interested in classroom learning, though, focused on, on life in the field and observations of organisms and natural phenomena in the field. Um, more and more toward the end of his life, um, in the last couple of years of his life, he was making very important strides in a very concrete ecological framework. But his journals from this time, um, he, he, died, he died suddenly, and his journals from this time weren't, weren't published, didn't come to light until uh, maybe 20 years ago. Um, he had no influence on the history of ecology, don't get me wrong. Um, he, but he is a great exemplar of, the, of a natural history approach, of patient description of natural phenomena. He, when I, I was a GSI in this course, I was a graduate student here, got my degree in this department, and I was a GSI for this course, and back then we, um, we learned that Thoreau coined the word ecology. Um, and in retrospect, it's understandable that historians made that mistake to attribute to Thoreau the coining of the word ecology. But in fact, his handwriting was just terrible, and uh, a historian mistook the word geology in his journals for the word ecology. And quite quickly, it made it into the Oxford English Dictionary and then into a New York Times book review. And before you knew it, everyone was saying, oh my gosh, Thoreau coined the word ecology. But again, it's an easy, it was an easy mistake to make based on Thoreau's work. Thoreau, he, he was interested in all natural phenomena, but plants, he was a very good botanist. He was a very keen observer of plants. He knew, you know, he would follow plants across the seasons. The one that lived on so-and-so's yard just, above, just below the oaks uh, before, the, before the first hill, he would revisit a particular plant over the course of the seasons to check on it, to check on its status, to check on its status in its life history, its, you know, its, its stage of growth, its, uh, its flowering times, its the time of its setting seed, and he recorded all these things in great detail, documenting carefully the days on which he was making the observations, any contextual information of relevance, and his notes were so good that scientists just recently could go back to them and look at the flowering times of these various plants in that region and compare them with the flowering times of the same species of plants today and interpret the changes in light of climatic change, relying on Thoreau's careful natural history observations, extracting the data from them, and using it to provide insight into the role of climate in structuring plant growth over the past hundred years or more. Data, there's a definition of data for you, and just recall that data is the plural form of the word, so try to say data are, um, data they are. Uh, the singular is datum, right? Um, we all stumble on that once in a while, but. Uh, there you go. Thoreau was reading Darwin, but Darwin wasn't reading Thoreau. No one was reading Thoreau at that time. But Thoreau read Darwin and liked him quite a lot. Um, we've all heard of Charles Darwin, who published his great work on the origin of species in 1859. In many ways, Darwin is the most important quote-unquote ecologist of this era. We tend to bow to the feet of Darwin, uh, Darwin the Great in biology, for his insights into evolution, and we do, we do so rightfully. Just an extraordinary body of work, and based on creative insight and careful study, both at, ho at home, in the lab, in the greenhouse, and in the field on his travels. And Darwin deserves a lot of credit 
for his role in the history of ecology. This could be illustrated in many ways, and I've, you know, I'm taking a very broad brush stroke approach to this history. This is one way to think about Darwin's intellectual contribution here with his metaphor of a tangled bank. And here's a quote um, that you can, you can read on your time um, where he refers to this rich network of interactions in a tangled bank, maybe something like this that he had in mind, this picture here, where all the organisms <coughs> are interacting one with the next, the plants with their roots in the soil, with the earthworms moving through it and aerating that soil and providing a medium of growth for those plants, with the birds hawking insects off of the branches of those plants and then defecating and returning some nitrogen to those soils, some of which makes it into the waterways, others which are taken back up to by the plants. This network of interactions really is what ecologists study. Ecologists study the interactions of organisms in relation to their environments. And Darwin did this as well as anybody. So soon after Darwin's great work, um, a German named Ernst Haeckel coined the word ecology. Um, here's Haeckel um, in his younger years uh, in the Canary Islands with a field assistant. <coughs> Wasn't, we don't think of him as a great field biologist. Um, he was an artist and a thinker. Um, but he, he is responsible for giving us this, this term. He was a great coiner of terms. And he derived the word ecology from these two roots, oikos and logos, the study of the home. What does he mean by home or house? What does it mean to study the house? What is the house? Habitat, habitat yeah. The study of the habitat of organisms or the place of dwelling, the place of living, the environment of organisms. And he defined it as the comprehensive science of the relationship of the organism to the environment. Quite a good definition in many ways from 1869. It's just one of his paintings there of, uh, of mosses and various bryophytes. He's a, quite a great artist. Let's jump to the uh, 20th century. Um, ecology's not really taking its roots yet as a formal scientific discipline. That, takes a, that, that really doesn't start happening until the 1960s. But you are starting to get in, in the 20s positions in ecology at universities or in, go in governmental contexts. Charles Elton was a very clear thinking field ecologist from this early period. Um, here he is, he was at Oxford. Um, there he is going off on his motorbike uh, with a bunch of live traps to study mice, um, setting off for the field. But he, he did some, he did very extensive work in the Arctic, in the far north. And this is an example of a food web that he constructed um, based on data collected in the field food webs being a very important part of ecological science, the um, studies of the interrelationships of organisms on the basis of their dietary habits. And he opened one of his, uh, his most famous book by saying ecology is a new name for a very old subject. It simply means scientific natural history. Scientific meaning in this context, systematic, maybe quantitative, based on not only description, but um, numerical uh, description, quantification, basing um, our observations in, in counting and numbers and math, um, bringing a, a more sophisticated method to our approach that could render it more scientific.
I'll talk more about Gauss, a Russian biologist, later. <coughs> but just bring him in here, I will, to highlight that it's n this, this pursuit is not entirely one of the field, but it involves experiments in the laboratory. Laboratory experiments make contributions to, to ecology in very important ways. Um, Gauss was studying paramecia in a laboratory context with for making formal experiments and um, deeply influencing the field. We'll get to his ideas on competitive exclusion later. And today, you don't even need to do laboratory experiments or go into the field. You could, you could model systems on the computer, simulation modeling, and make contributions to ecological science. But ecology is best, is at its best when it integrates these approaches. It's best when the models are based on empirical data from the field or from the lab. And the th these, these three components, field, lab, and theory, reinforce and support each other. So let's get into more modern definitions of ecology and some that are very, um, have been very influential. Um, in the 60s, an Australian ecologist defined ecology as the scientific study of the distribution and abundance of organisms. Distribution and abundance. Spatial distribution and abundance. The numbers, how many are there? Or how, what is their density? the density of organisms, or the biomass, how much do they all weigh? Distribution and abundance. It's the scientific study of the distribution and abundance. But that's a little static. That's a little um, narrow as a definition. It does, certainly doesn't encompass uh, the full range of ecology. Better, a little bit better, is uh, a definition that's, um, that you hear quite a lot in an ecology course, at a, in an undergraduate ecology course, by Charles Krebs the scientific study of the interactions that determine the distribution and abundance of organisms. So you can use that as a working definition if you want. You could use one of the older definitions that I've given you if you want. Hopefully you're getting a sense of, a um, better sense of what ecology is. Let me give you an example of um, distribution and abundance, the study of distribution and abundance. The cattle egret is a is a fine little bird that lives in, used to live in only in the old world in Africa. There's one riding on the back of a wildebeest or something. Um, in their breeding plumage, they have these nice orangey yellow plumes on the back of their heads. They tend to use big mammals to follow big mammals as they move around and they pick up insects anything that's flushed by the big mammals as they walk, as the hooves and feet disturb the ground, grasshoppers and a lizard might get partially stepped on and the bird will go in and pick it up. It forms this relationship with these other mammals. This was an African bird, and a well-known African bird. In the 1930s, a small flock of these guys blew across the Atlantic and landed in South America. An incredible dispersal event that was apparently very well documented, this, uh, the arrival of this small flock. And from that point of arrival in South America in 1937, they've expanded throughout the New World. Think about how that dis dispersal event affected the distribution and abundance of cattle egrets. It affected it quite a lot across the globe in, you know, in terms of their range and their overall numbers on a global scale. Let's take another example of distribution and abundance. That's Australia, and that's a kangaroo. And it shows the limits of the range of these red kangaroos, Macropus rufus. And the hotter areas here are um, the areas of greater density in terms of the number of kangaroos per square kilometer as described here. The limits of the range tend to correlate with, with what? Who knows the landscape there a little bit? What are those limits? The dry areas. Yeah, the, the limits of the occupied areas are the driest areas of the continent. Those coastal areas are much wetter and maybe less variable in 
less uh, in their in their aridity. So for some reason, the kangaroos are <coughs> occupying primarily the driest areas, the arid and semi-arid areas. Why? I'd um, I'd like you to consider why after watching a video that I'll that I'll uh, provide for you either at the end here today or I'll give you it as a stream online. I don't want to take the time to do it right now. Ecology is not environmentalism. The two have become so closely related that in the, in the public's eye, if you say you're an ecologist, they might think that you are an environmentalist. And they may be right, because many ecologists, as a result of their studies, are led to action in a political context in terms of um, wanting to make changes that support a healthy environment. But the two, the two fields are not um, synonymous. They're not equivalent. Ecology will speak of as the scientific study of organisms and their interrelationships. Environmentalism is, we'll think of more as a socio-political movement to, toward creating healthy and sustaining healthy ecosystems. Let's use Rachel Carson as an example of a, a biologist and an ecologist working in the field and studying um, organisms who was led in her s by her studies to draw attention to the role of pesticides in the decline of bird populations. Pesticides, particularly DDT, DDT at this time, were causing the thinning of eggshells as a result of getting into food chains and making their way into the tissues of birds that then laid eggs. The, the shells of these eggs were thinned to the point where they were cracking, and many birds were having trouble surviving. Her book, Silent Spring, drew attention to this phenomenon, and Silent Spring, a reference to just how quiet it had gotten in the springs that used to be rich with birdsong. And this was one of the major catalysts for the environmental movement. This is an ecologist who catalyzed socio-political action as a result of her scientific work. So they are closely related, but they're not the same thing. Just finishing the discussion of um, this early period, this, this image alone is, is thought by historians to have been one of the major factors in the launching of the environmental movement when human beings saw Earth from space for the first time, you know, a, a, a spinning and fragile appearing blue planet against the dark recesses of space. That image alone, for many people, triggered a, an awareness of our, our globe as a, as a single and a fragile home. All right, you guys, you guys have hung in there well. Please try to come back on Monday. Have a great weekend. <laughs>